Nasser al-Din al-Tusi, born in 1201 and died in 1274. The 13th century was one of the most destructive periods in Islamic history, as Abbasid political authority rapidly deteriorated. Countless fiefdoms mushroomed across the Muslim world, dealing a lasting blow to Islamic political unity and solidarity. Increasingly seen a mere figurehead without any real political or military power, the Abbasid Khalif's apparent weakness made the Islamic East vulnerable to foreign attacks. In fact, the fragility of the Khalif's position became all too clear when the Mongol hordes emerged from Asia and threatened to overwhelm the heartland of Islam. Once a great seat of Islamic political, military and intellectual dominance, Baghdad now was a shadow of his former self. Thanks to the Bayt al-Hikmah, the House of Wisdom of the early Abbasid era and the Nizamiya College of Seljuk period, the Muslim world once led the world in intellectual and literary pursuits. But following the rapid decline of Islamic political power and military might during the 13th century, the glorious era of Islamic political, cultural and intellectual dominance seemed to be coming to an end. During this sad and tumultuous period in Islamic history, Nasr al-Din al-Tusi emerged to reinvigorate the Islamic intellectual world by founding one of the Islamic history's most prominent institutions of higher education. Abu Jafar Muhammad ibn Muhammad ibn Hassan Nasir al-Din al-Tusi was born in Tus, in the Persian province of Khurasan. A contemporary of St. Thomas Aquinas, the renowned Catholic theologian and Albertus Magnus, known as Albert the Great, who were two of the most influential figures of European scholastic thought. Al-Tusi's father was a prominent religious scholar and jurist who ensured his son received a thorough education in Arabic, Persian and traditional Islamic sciences. Raised in a family where learning and education was considered to be a way of life, Al-Tusi developed his thirst for knowledge and wisdom from an early age so that the pursuit of knowledge became his main preoccupation in his life. After completing his elementary education at home, he went to Nishapur to pursue advanced education in Islamic, philosophical and other sciences of the day. As a thriving centre of intellectual and commercial activity and the home of the famous Nizamiya College, where the influential Al-Ghazali once lived and taught, Nishapur at the time attracted students from far and wide. Here he studied philosophy, mathematics and medicine under the guidance of prominent scholars like Farid al-Din al-Damad, a philosopher affiliated to the peripatetic school of Ibn Sina. Gamal al-Din ibn Yunus, an eminent scientist and mathematician of the time, and Qutb al-Din al-Masri, who was a student of the illustrious Fakhr al-Din al-Razi and also an eminent authority on medical sciences in his own right. Known to have been a gifted student, Al-Tusi not only learned philosophy, mathematics, astronomy and other scientific subjects of his day, but also mastered the traditional Islamic sciences and received ijaza or certification, the equivalent of a modern university degree in Hadith, prophetic traditions, when he was barely 21. And although he was a Shia scholar of the Ithna Nashari, the Twelver traditions, he was admired by both the Shia and Sunni population of Nishapur, on account of his vast learning and erudition. It was only in his early 20s when Khurasan was invaded by the Mongols and this forced him to seek sanctuary with the followers of the neo ismaili assassin, the Nizari sect. Founded by Hassani Sabah, this extremist religious sect became notorious for assassinating their opponents. Surrounded by the rough steeps of Central Asia, the followers of this group created a safe haven for themselves in Alamut, it was under the patronage of the Nizari sect Nasr al-Din Abdurrahman that Al-Tusi authored scores of books and treaties on philosophy, logic, ethics and mathematics. His acclaimed Kitab al-Akhlaq al-Nasiri, the book of Nasirian ethics, was composed during this period. 
and as the title of the book indicates, it was dedicated to his patron Nasr al-Din Abd rahman Following the Mongol capture of Alamut in 1255, al-Tusi experienced considerable personal hardship and suffering. But impressed by his vast learning and erudition, the Mongol ruler, Hulagu, appointed him as his personal advisor. Al-Tusi was with the Mongol warlord when he launched his devastating attack on Baghdad, the seat of the Abbasid Caliphate, in 1258. The destruction of Baghdad, coupled with the manner in which the reigning Abbasid Khalif al-Mustahsin was murdered, truly shocked and horrified the Muslim world. As a Hulagu personal advisor, he may have played some part in the carnage wrought in Baghdad, although it is not clear how significant that role was. According to some Shia sources, it was Al-Tusi who urged the Mongols to attack Baghdad because he was eager to bring down the Sunni Abbasid Caliphate. But according to other historians, this story has little credence because Hulagu, in their opinion, would have attacked Baghdad come what might. Therefore, Al-Tusi could not have instigated or prevented the attack on Baghdad because he himself was entirely reliant on the goodwill of the Mongol ruler. Being no more than a useful guide and advisor to Hulagu, his position within the Mongol political hierarchy was thus a limited one. Nonetheless, the Mongol sack of Baghdad was a truly unprecedented event. From being once the home of some of the Muslim world's finest schools, colleges, libraries, hospitals, the Mongols turned Baghdad into rubble. As an eminent intellectual and writer, such mindless killings and wanton destruction might have shocked and horrified Al-Tusi, who reportedly tried to prevent the destruction of the city's libraries and hospitals, but to no avail. His failure to save the city's libraries probably inspired Al-Tusi to construct the Maragha Observatory, which later became one of the Islamic world's finest institutions of higher education and learning. Ironically, this was achieved thanks largely to the generous patronage of Hulagu himself. After the observatory was complete in 1261, al went out of his way to recruit some of the leading Muslim scholars and scientists of the day to this institution. And they included Qutb al-Din al-Shirazi and Mu'ayyad al-Din al-Urdi, who taught and conducted research there. Also, this institution housed more than 40,000 books on all the sciences of the day, and some of the books were most probably rescued from the ransacked libraries of Baghdad and Damascus. As a director of the observatory and a prominent astronomer, al Tusi promoted research in all aspects of science, philosophy, mathematics and religious studies. And during this period he composes magnum opus, the Jizi Ilkhani, the astronomical catalogue of the Ilkhanid ruler, which he dedicated to Hulagu, his Mongol patron. And in addition to this, he authored scores of treaties on philosophy, theology, ethics, mathematics and astronomy. In these works, he not only revised and reformulated the ideas and thoughts of his predecessors, but he also made considerable advances in arithmetic, trigonometry and geometry. Most significantly in the field of astronomy, he proposed a new theory of planetary motion which was different from the Ptolemaic theory and which later inspired Qutb al-Din al-Shirazi, Ulugh Beg, Ibn al-Shatir and Copernicus to formulate their own theories of planetary motion. Although Copernicus is today considered to be the first person to have formulated the heliocentric theory, there is no doubt that the astronomical ideas and thoughts of al Tusi and his successors profoundly influenced him. As Victor Roberts, a noted historian of science, has pointed out in his research paper, The Solar and Lunar Theory of Ibn al-Shatir, published in 1962. Indeed, writing on spherical trigonometry, he pointed out in his Kitab Shakal al-Kitta, the book of the quadrilateral, how trigonometry was an independent subject in its own right, separate from astronomy. With the publication of this book, he firmly established both planar and spherical trigonometry as distinct branches of mathematics, which later influenced prominent Muslim astronomers and mathematicians like Ghiyath al-Din Jamshid Masood al-Qashi, 
was a colleague of Ulugh Beg at the Timurid Observatory in Samarkand. Also, as an eloquent exponent of peripatetic philosophy, Al-Tusi wrote an extensive commentary on Ibn Sina's acclaimed philosophical treatise, Al-Isharat wal Tanbihat, the remarks and admonitions known as Shah Al-Isharat wal Tanbihat, exegesis of remarks and admonitions. In this book, he defended Ibn Sina against a charge of heresy, levelled at him by prominent scholars and thinkers like Al-Ghazali and Fakhradina Razi. If Ibn Rushd's refutation of Al-Ghazali's philosophical polemic gained much acclaim in the Islamic West, then Al-Tusi's defence of Ibn Sina was instrumental in the revival of peripatetic philosophy in Persia. In truth, he was very fond of Ibn Sina, so much so that he considered himself to be one of his students and disciples, although he was born nearly two centuries after Ibn Sina. In addition, he studied the works of other prominent thinkers like Al-Ghazali, Fakhr al-Din al-Razi, Shihab al-Din al-Surawadi, and was profoundly influenced by them. Nevertheless, his Shar al-Ishirat is rated very highly by the Shia scholars. This is probably because it is an explanatory work rather than an original philosophical treatise which attempts to espouse fresh ideas and thoughts. Not surprisingly, many commentaries have been written on this book by prominent Shia thinkers, like Jamal al-Din Hassan ibn Yusuf al-Hilli, as an adherent and exponent of 12 Shiism, Al-Tusi wrote prolifically on the Ithna al-Ashari theology. Indeed, he was one of the first to systematically formulate the fundamental tenets of Shia beliefs and practices. Of his theological works, Tajri al-Ittikadat, the definition of fundamental beliefs, is today widely considered to be the Summa Theologica of Twelve Shiism, and this book became so popular in Persia that scores of influential Shia scholars and theologians like Shams al-Din al-Bayaki, al-Hilli, al-Al-Din Kushji and al-Jurjani wrote extensive commentaries on it. However, as a religious scholar and jurist, Al-Tusi believed that the masses should refrain from engaging in complex theological debates and discussions because, he believed, this could lead to doctrinal uncertainty and theological misunderstandings. Only those who were well versed in the religious sciences were, in his view, qualified to engage in such debate. Indeed, he urged the masses to fulfil their religious obligations and live their lives in accordance with the Sharia, leaving the onus of interpreting and formulating the Sharia to the religious scholars, the ulama and the jurists, fuqaha. By contrast, his ethical views, which he expounded most eloquently in his Kitab al-Akhlaq al-Nasiri, and other treaties are both complex and thought-provoking. Influenced by the works of Aristotle, Al-Farabi, Ibn Miskawi, and Ibn al-Mukafa on the one hand, and the ideas and thoughts of ancient Persian and Indian philosophers and sages on the other, he developed a comprehensive and universalistic ethical philosophy. The purpose of his ethical philosophy was to nourish and cultivate people's moral and ethical qualities through the incessant pursuit of knowledge. This, he felt, would contribute to the development of good human character and personality. Keen to promote religious tolerance and cultural harmony, his ethical discourse sought to unite people of all religious and racial backgrounds on the basis of our common humanity. Although his ethical thinking was not entirely original, it was nevertheless very ambitious and deserves much more recognition, especially in this day and age, than it has so far received. The likes of Al-Kindi, Abu Bakr al-Razi, Ibn Sina and Ibn Rushd before him, Al-Tusi was a great thinker and encyclopedist, but unlike them, his works did not gain much currency beyond the borders of Persia, perhaps because he wrote primarily in Persian author of more than 100 books and treaties on almost all the sciences of his days. Al-Tusi died at the age of 73 during the reign of Abaka, the son of the successor of Hulagu, and was buried in Ghazimain.
located on the outskirts of Baghdad.